Hello there, welcome to Showcase. DC's Mexican-American superhero Blue Beetle has finally hit the big screen. Its director says the film pays tribute not just to Mexican heritage, but all Latin American cultures. Excuse me, Mr. Reyes? Sholo Maridueña plays Jamie Reyes, a.k.a. Blue Beetle, in DC's latest superhero adventure. I feel so out of reach. You always land on your feet. Reyes is a college graduate who finds himself in possession of an ancient scarab that chooses him as its symbiotic host. And once it attaches itself to Reyes, he transforms into a superhero. You went in to get a job. Blue Beetle is DC Comics' first Latino superhero. He's Mexican-American. As for the film's director, Angel Manuel Soto, he's Puerto Rican and he didn't hesitate to throw in both Mexican references and elements of other Latin American cultures throughout the film. We never were like, okay, so how are we going to make this scene Latino? No, nah, not at all. Um, we cannot hide who we are, and if, if we have the opportunity to, to tell our collective experiences, uh, because we are Latino, they're going to come out Latino. Yeah. So, and there's so much more things that that we have in common than, than not, that being able to embrace them and also live in the, in the specificities of certain things mm -hmm. that might only happen in Mexico, but maybe it happens in Puerto Rico, but differently. Okay, it's gonna be okay. But at the same time, Soto says he didn't want to brownwash the script either. It's okay if there's like familiarities with certain things, but I didn't want to be the person that, that, I, that, that my Latinidad had to uh, conform mm -hmm. to somebody else's expectations of Latinidad. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted to be able to be free and I wanted the actors that I hired that are Latino to be authentically themselves. Yeah. I think all of Latinos are going to connect. Mm -hmm. And consequentially, other people that are not Latino are also going to connect yeah. if they're open and curious. The scarab chose you. But it belongs to me. Blue Beetle has received mixed reviews from critics. For Audrey Fox, and in six months. But Brandon Zachary isn't so downbeat. He says while Blue Beetle may be a fairly simple story, it's elevated by its charming cast and distinct voice. It's been more than four months since the conflict in Sudan broke out. According to multiple United Nations agencies, the situation is spiraling out of control with millions in need of humanitarian aid. And a Sudanese artist paints wartime emotions to help the world see how damaging a war can be. This exhibit offers no vibrant colors or joyful portraits. These art pieces rather reflect the trauma, depression, and sorrow of war. Sudanese artist Abdel Rahman Abdallah wanted to document and show the world what's happening in Sudan. So he created these artworks in Ethiopia and called his exhibit Dark Tears. So I come here for one month, I did these paintings, uh, because um, I have a lot of feelings that I have to express too about the war, or war, about what's happened to us. And always I have a lot of time. Not like when I'm home, you have to go back to soup, to market, to bring some things. So my full time is just for painting, for this project, and which I call it uh, dark tears. So that's what I feel about the darkness that happened in, in, in Sudan. Abdullah, who escaped the conflict in Khartoum, says his art represents how damaging the ongoing war is, not only for the people, but also for the culture and history of his country. When you see it, it will help you to see what's going on in the human mind, human pictures, uh, human uh, anatomy, some paintings are distorted, a lot of distortions of the city, a lot of distortions of the human faces, human figures, and see exactly what's happening in the world. So people can get a message from this. If it's a visual message or a psychological message, they have to, to feel there's something wrong happened to this human being. 
Humanitarian organizations urge immediate international action for Sudan, where there's mass displacement and millions on the verge of famine. And now, Abdullah hopes his art pieces will help that call grow louder. A new exhibition at London's Africa Center is exploring Nigeria's Fuji music. It remains one of the country's most important music scenes and has also laid the foundation for today's Afrobeat. Fuji music is primarily traced to southwest Nigeria and it's one of the most important music genres to have come out of West Africa. It's undergone a number of transformations over the last seven decades. So Fuji didn't actually emerge to like the early 1970s. Um, now, over the last sort of five, six decades, it's taken many evolutions. Um, there's been so many players who have created incredible, iconic music that have sort of influenced contemporary pop music. And, you know, I don't think there's a better reference to the influence of Fuji than what we have now called Afrobeat, uh, because the bedrock of Afrobeat sonically is embedded in Fuji. The exhibition came to London from Lagos, it includes newly found archival footage and artifacts. It also explores Fuji's music past, foundations, and its rich subculture in an immersive experience. We've designed a 10-day exhibition um, where people can come, um, and we really encourage everybody to come. Um, it's really an edutainment exhibition, by I'm honest, and we've also curated it so that it's family oriented because I've always said that it's an opportunity for us to learn a lot about African culture. It's an opportunity for us to learn about Nigerian history. Much of the exhibition is dedicated to the instruments and equipment musicians used over the years, the microphone installation is an ode to Fuji Jump, a musical battle artists had in the 70s. Now, we are showing 29 microphones. Those microphones are over 30 years old, and they've essentially been donated to us by some of the artists who participated in Fuji Jump. Some of them are dead, some of them are alive today. So those microphones have a lot of heritage. So I am particularly fond of those microphones. There's so much history in them. And even when I touch it, I get sort of Goosebumps. The exhibition is on until August 28th. Remember when NASA published pictures from the Webb telescope and blew everyone's minds? Now at a new exhibit in New York, those who are curious about space can fully immerse themselves in the discoveries of the world's most powerful telescope. Starbirds galaxy collisions, and the water existence on other planets are just some of the marvels captured by the James Webb Space Telescope in 2022. The revelations inspired the Arctic House Studio to curate Beyond the Light. The exhibit uses technology and art to create motion in a dynamic tale through what would otherwise be static imagery. NASA's team of leading experts helped Arctic House to construct a narrative from the data Webb has collected. The studio then developed the exhibit's visual identity, building a unique artistic expression with the advanced ways of practical storytelling. In an interview, James Webb Space Telescope's lead engineer Mike Menzel said that he's gratified to see the Webb's images are now becoming part of the pop culture. Beyond the Light has a number of installations that observe various facets of light and its role in our comprehension of the cosmos, while offering a distinctive perspective. The exhibit examines our interaction with light in a cinematic experience and the wisdom we've gained as a civilization. The show also includes six supporting exhibits that delve into topics like heliophysics, the Moon, the Mars rover, and NASA's aerospace engineering developments we use in our everyday lives. The exhibit's visual ambiance is already superlunary, but is further enhanced by a stellar soundscape. The soundscape was composed by Istanbul-based composer Mehmet Unal. The artists use galactic data to submerge visitors deeper into the journey of light.
Beyond the Light combines knowledge and creativity in equal measure. It is based on scientific evidence and is brought to life with cutting-edge technology and innovative artistic expression. The show will run in New York until mid-September before traveling to Washington, D.C. Venezuela is paying tribute to one of its biggest artists of all time. This month marks the centenary of the birth of the late Carlos Cruz Diaz. And now a new project is making sure everyone gets to see more of his works. This tram-looking bus has started tours in the Venezuelan city of Valencia to celebrate the kinetic art master Carlos Cruz Diaz. His works are scattered around the city and as part of the initiative, visitors get to see them all at once, while gaining more in-depth info about his pieces. Here's the Statos Tower. The colourful lines that adorn the building's façade is the work of Cruz Diaz. The artist made sure all the colours that make up the installation created a sensation of movement, as if they weren't static. It was the first time that I really made this tour of each of his works, and today I saw one of the works that I had previously visualized, but I had not taken in the details of the one at the Stratus Tower, and well, today I contemplated what the master Carlos Cruz Diaz really wanted to express through it. Cruz Diaz also became one of the leading figures of op art, a style of visual art that uses optical illusions. He went on to gain worldwide fame in the 1970s. And though he lived in Paris from the 1960s till his death in 2019, for the coordinator of the initiative, he's still as Venezuelan as it gets. Knowing the life of Cruz Diaz, knowing his works, understanding them and preserving them is a link, a nexus that unites us with the cultural development of Venezuela. Cruz Diaz once said, one of the fundamental conditions of art is to provoke astonishment, and it seems he never ceases to amaze. Black piano technicians are hard to find in countries across Africa, but in South Africa, things are slowly changing. Here's more. Tepiso Ledwaba visits the University of South Africa auditorium when no one's around. He's the first black African to get a certification as a Steinway piano technician. With a full scholarship, Ledwaba trained for years at the US-based Oberlin College to receive the honor. But before that, he played gigs as a singer and musician in South Africa's capital, Pretoria and it was when Ledwaba was offered to teach children how to play musical instruments that he realized good technicians were hard to find. In South Africa, for more than 50 years now, it's only been white people. If you call a piano technician, hey, my piano is off tune. Most of the time comes a white person who does this. So first of all, when people call me because they see my name, it's a piece of so piso can be white. The skill of tuning pianos is a dying art, especially on a continent where few can afford the expensive instruments. We need to teach it. It's, 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 it's artisanry. It's like every field of artisanry. Everyone needs to know how to use their hands. The skill is also an option for young black musicians who know the difficulties of making a living in the field. Seeing him on the field actually makes me, yeah, make me clear and more um, passionate actually, yeah, to encourage other people also to vent into music, not only to play, but there's also other fields around music or maybe around the industry, I could put it, yeah, they can actually work on, yeah, and then master their crafts. As for Ledwaba, he says he's still learning but hopes to teach everything he knows so far to train other black piano technicians in South Africa.
A newly opened cafe in occupied Gaza gives customers a chance to play with cats. The aim is to provide a respite from the daily stress of living in a blockaded territory. Take a look. This cat cafe in Gaza is a part of a global trend of cafes that offer customers some time with cats. But the circumstances are unique. The territory has been under a crippling Israeli blockade since 2007 and the residents are always in need of some stress-free time. Cats, for me, are a refuge that relieves me of psychological stress. So I thought of creating a project that combines serving people with something to cheer them up. That's where the idea of the cafe came from. It combines the concept of a normal coffee shop with the cute twist of having your cup of coffee while playing with a cat that will make you smile and forget about the pressures of life beyond the walls of this shop. The cats at the cafe have mostly been raised by Nehma Mabad at her home. She also got some from her friends. The price to play with the cats for an hour is about two and a half dollars. The entrance fees for the cat zone are purely aimed at covering their food and drink. The cafe section functions like any other normal cafe in Gaza. Not to mention the fees for their medical care and food. Taking care of them is costly. All the visitors have to pay an extra fee to play with the cats. They're more than happy to do so. The cats here are beautiful and sweet, so it's a wonderful idea, despite it being a novelty in our society. And when I heard about it, I felt happy. Someone who loves cats will come visit and won't care about the cost. But I don't think it's a high fee, it's appropriate. Under the current circumstances, pets in Gaza are rare. So the Meow Cat Cafe could be the perfect spot to enjoy some time with these gorgeous felines. Bankable movies made for young adults had their heyday back in the 1980s. But they are now enjoying a revival. And the latest addition to that trend is adapted from a novel with plenty of franchise potential. I saw an old lady with like long gray hair. She called out my name and she said my dad was still alive. What? And I know it can't be true because I watched him die. <laughs> Production companies are after young adults, and they have been that way ever since Steven Spielberg directed and produced a series of features that eventually became blockbusters 40 years ago. She was supposed to be here yesterday, but she never came. Maybe she's in serious trouble. What were you even doing at that house? Do you know about Bat Lady? She's our town boogeyman. She only comes out at night, and she steals children, and she eats them. I'm kidding. In 2016, Netflix took that inspiration to make the fantasy show and smash hit Stranger Things. Since then, Hollywood had been trying to recreate its success. I remembered I actually am claustrophobic. Isn't that funny? This butterfly was connected to your dad and to Ashley. You think he's ready for the truth? He's not ready. Amazon is now a serious competitor in that field and has dibs on author Harlan Coben's Mickey Bolitar books. Coben's a mystery writer who also happens to dash out young adult fiction. Who are you on the following? Uh, your new coach. Surprised he didn't tell you he wants me to try out for the team too. <laughs> oh, uh, you sure about that? That was the, it was the wind. <laughs> it's going that way. <laughs> Amazon's first adaptation of the series is Shelter. In it, Mickey starts a new school in New Jersey, and his friend Ashley goes missing. So he sets out to find out what might have happened to her. They move again. Nothing stays constant, Mickey. It's like I always told you, you can't get a hit if you don't swing the bat. Don't worry. Who's worried? Critics call to look at the underbelly of peaceful suburban life and say it has all the charm to balance the mystery. They have even compared it to the 1985 movie, The Goonies, that kickstarted the whole thing in the first place. 
Wow. Mm. Okay, I'll remember that. Uh, yeah, remember this. The cast say the show also shares similar themes, such as friendship, forming bonds with unlikely people, and also banding together for the common good. That sense of camaraderie unfolds over three books that make up the Baltar series. And given their popularity, Amazon may keep the interest of kids on its side for quite some time. If we could get all the security footage the day Ashley disappeared... Yeah, it would definitely be really hard to download every second of every surveillance camera the day Ashley disappeared. I downloaded every second from every surveillance camera on the day Ashley disappeared. How'd you pull You're that? serious. <laughs> It's a mad, 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 mad world is the original spectacle comedy film. On its 60th anniversary, the feature stands as a symbol of Hollywood's ambitions. And in our movie Almanac, Alijan explains why Tinseltown felt it was vital to produce it to save itself. You, you take the controls. I don't know how to fly an airplane. Well, there's really nothing, nothing to it. But Becky, but, 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 you can't fly. Well, that's nonsense. Anybody can fly a plane. Now here, now I'll, I'll, I'll check you out. Put your little hands on the wheel. Ah, that's it. Now you have it. Now the feet on the rudder. You got it? There you go. Feet on the rudder. That's not set. Who says this boy can't fly this old plane? There you go. 1963's It's a Mad, Mad, Mad World tells the story of a group of people who race across California State to find supposedly hidden loot. It's a fast-paced, chaotic comedy, and it's epic in both scope and vision. There's a good reason for that. See, back then, television was entertaining audiences at home for free, and the movie industry wanted them back in theaters. They thought the best way to do that was to keep things big. Hollywood had tried that formula with the dramas and got good response. Applying that to comedy made sense, obviously. So the jokes and the chases got bigger. Studio heads even got Stanley Kramer, a high-drama filmmaker, to give it that epic edge. Oh, man. Oh, oh. No, stop, please. No, oh, no please, please, stop. Yeah. Oh. Vision Matthews. No, Sheriff. Chief isn't here. He's a little late this morning. Box office attractions like Spencer Tracy were added to a star-studded cast that included comedy giants Buster Keaton and Mickey Rooney. The film was also the first one to be produced in the single projector Cinerama format. Cinerama could be best described as the precursor to today's big IMAX screens. But in the end, critics thought there were too many jokes in It's a Mad, Mad, Mad World, and that the story suffered from excess. However, it's still regarded by filmmakers as a milestone in out-of-control comedy, which would become a subgenre of its own with films like Steven Spielberg's 1941 and Rat Race. A great way to start the day. You wait for 15 years to solve a really important case, and just when you get It's all right, Chief. I'll get it for you. You did it again. Look, we figured it 17 different ways. And every time we figured it, it was no good, because no matter how we figured it, somebody didn't like the way we figured it. So now, there's only one way to figure it, and that is every man, including the old bag, for himself. So good luck and may the best man win. It's a mad, mad, mad world also stands as an example of the great lengths Hollywood would go to in order to compete with television. And it's a competition which is rearing its head again today with the rise of a new rival, streaming services. That's it for this episode of Showcase. I'm Estra Drust from me and the whole team here in Istanbul. Thanks so much for watching and bye for now. <laughs>